I don't want to like uh, kind of freak you out, and make you think I have ESP or something, but I, I kind of tried to anticipate, you know, what might you want to ask me, and, and this is what I thought it might be. <laughs> what can the science of science communication do for climate communicators? Did I get it right? I mean, it is kind of amazing. And <laughs> <laughs> so, but don't, don't freak out. And, and I don't know, Steve mentioned a short presentation. I guess that's coming up later because what I thought I would do, <laughs> To answer your question is just basically like tell you everything I know uh, about climate communication, um, and, and then that would probably somewhere in that is the is the answer. Um, actually, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna answer your question, but I, I am gonna tell you everything I know. At which point, I think you're gonna be able to answer the question. I, don't worry, because everything I know about climate science communication it fits in that little box right there. I mean, the print's really small, but still, I'll, I'll kind of go through it. Right? Th this, is the, this is what I know. <laughs> that, that what ordinary members of the public believe about climate change doesn't reflect what they know. <laughs> it, it expresses who they are. Right? So, see? Now you know, now you know what to do to, co to communicate climate science. I mean, well, it's a little bit more to it. I mean, you, you, a few connecting principles. So, you know, start out with something like less controversial and build up to, to climate change. But belief in evolution, right? Here, the, there's, you probably see, have seen this, uh, well, you see this graph about once every 18 months. Um, that's, that's how long the, in, the cycle is, I guess, for us to forget that about half the population uh, says that they don't believe in evolution when Gallup asks them this. And whenever uh, that survey gets released, um, there's always this kind of collective expression of, of shock um, and, and dismay. You know, what's wrong with our science education system? Even Miss America doesn't know um, about evolution. Um, and that response, in addition to, to, I guess, betraying a kind of short attention span since we have been being told this every 18 months for about 30 years, um, also reflects a, a kind of uh, well, if not science illiteracy, at least science of science communication illiteracy, um, because there's a lot of research out there. Um, and what it shows is that uh, the relationship between the answer you give to this question, uh, do you believe in evolution or evolution, humans evolved from some other species of animal, true or false, ha has uh, zero correlation uh, with actual comprehension. Uh, of natural selection, random mutation, genetic variance, the, the core elements of the modern synthesis. Right? So the people who, who say that they believe in evolution, they're no more or less likely to be able to give you basically a, a high school exam quality explanation of how evolution works than the people who say that they don't. Um, and in fact, neither one of them is very likely to be able to do that. Right? And that, that might be a problem with our science education system. But obviously, the answer you give to the question, do you believe in evolution or not, that's not an indicator of what people know about evolution. Um, what it is an indicator of is, is their religiosity. Uh, essentially, people convey who they are when you ask them that question. And if they have a cultural style that features religiosity, then they're likely to say no. Um, and, and this is a conclusion, too that rests on empirical research um, into what it is that you're measuring when you ask people the, the question, human beings evolve from another species of animals, true or false? That's a, a question on the, the National Science Foundation science indicators, science literacy test, and a, a whole bunch of other standardized tests that are used to kind of keep track of how the American public is doing over time and compare how we're doing to other countries. We're, we're just a little bit behind Afghanistan now on the, on the indicators, right? But you have a bunch, of, a bunch of questions, right? And you see how Americans do. Well, you can compare how, how people do on that question about evolution to how they do on the rest of the questions. But to give you an idea, right, there are a couple questions. Electrons are smaller than atoms. That, that's a pretty easy question, right? Because if, if, I, if I look at how people do on the exam, then even the person who's right at the mean score, right, the 50th percentile, there's still a 70% chance that that person's going to get that right. So it's not a very hard question. This one's a little harder. Which gas makes up most of the Earth's atmosphere? Hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. It's not underlined on the test. And, and <laughs> it's kind of hard because if you're, if you're around the middle, right, of the, of the group, you get the, the average score, only about 20% likelihood that you're going to get that one right. So it's harder, right? Now here is the question, human beings as we know them today develop from an earlier species of animals, true or false? And it doesn't quite 
look right. <laughs> you see that the, the questions that are measuring what people know, they have this kind of profile. As you do better on the test overall, the likelihood that you're going to get the answer correct goes up. But here, the, the, the difference in likelihood of getting this answer correct, true, doesn't vary that much, whether you're at the mean, whether you're standard deviation below the mean, standard deviation above, 98 percentile. It's not really tightly correlated with how you're doing on the rest of the exam. And here's why. The question might be understood to be measuring the science comprehension, right, which is what the test overall measures, in people who are below average in religiosity, which you can measure by asking them how important is religion in your life, how often do you go to church, how often do you pray, other kinds of questions like that. They give you some information about how important religion is in people's lives. And if you're below average in that, well, then the, the, the likelihood you'll get this answer right kind of bears the, the profile you associate with a question that probably is measuring that kind of comprehension in people whose ability in that uh, dimension varies. But that's not true for the people who are, are above average in religiosity. Right? It, no, no matter how well you do on the rest of the test, well, in fact, the better you do in the rest of the test, it's almost the less likely you are to get that one right. Um, now, this is not because people who are above average in religiosity don't know as much science. Um, in fact, there's a tiny little correlation between religiosity and how you score on the test. But what I'm showing you here, these, these item response profiles are telling you what the likelihood that somebody is to get the answer correct given that they have a certain score on the test, right? So people who are above average and below average in religiosity, they're generally going to be as likely to get the, the answer correct given that they're at the same level on the test as one another. You would expect them to, right? But that's not true. Right? It's true for all, all the questions except for, for evolution, right? It, it, on the electrons, the person the, the, the person's above average in religiosity was in 98th percentile. Right? He's, he's nailing. He or she's nailing all the other questions. Still only 40% likely or less to get the, this evolution question right. See, it's just not measuring what people who are above average in religiosity know about science. Right? It's, it's orthogonal. It's measuring something else. Why well, say it's measuring essentially their religiosity? Because if you're somebody who's above average in religiosity, you'll probably convey that by saying, no, human beings didn't evolve from other species of animals. But you can do a little experiment and figure out that that's true. You can just add the words at the beginning of the item, according to the theory of evolution, human beings as we know them today developed from an earlier species of animals. And, and that disparity in, in the relationship of what the question is measuring in people who are more religious and less religious with respect to their science comprehension, it disappears. Because at that stage, you've, you've given some distance between the answer a person gives to the question and the identity. Right? At that point, somebody can show you what they know is the, the prevailing view in science if they're religious without having to risk conveying some position that essentially denigrates their identity, right? You, you've disentangled those, and you find out they know just as much, and which isn't very much because this is, this is too easy a question, right? Now, this has important practical implications too, right? There's, there's research on this. You can teach kids who say they don't believe in evolution, evolution, the, the modern synthesis, natural selection, random uh, mutation, genetic variants, just as readily as the kids who say that they do believe in evolution. And you do it in the same way. Um, you know, they, they all make the same mistake. They think that the reason that the giraffe's neck is long is that one giraffe was trying to reach up and get a coconut, and its neck stretched, and then the baby had a slightly longer neck. They have a kind of naive Lamarckian view. You say, no, that's not how it works. And you explain all the mechanism. They go, oh, that's really interesting. Right? Now, at the end of the course, the kid who said, I don't believe in evolution, still says, I don't believe in evolution, <laughs> right? Because you haven't made that person into somebody else. You've just given that person some knowledge that they wouldn't otherwise have had. And in fact, the one thing this research shows is that if you make the goal of the instruction to have that person who said, I didn't believe in evolution, say, I believe it, that's the one thing that will actually prevent that person from learning. Because at that point, you've, you've put the person in, having, in the position of having to make a choice between knowing what's known by science and essentially being who they are. <laughs> and people will be who they are. That's important to them. That's a major stake that they have. So don't create that kind of conflict. 
And that's an important, important understanding in the teaching of evolution. You know, now I can talk about the, the belief in global warming. Because right? we see this, this survey, not every 18 months, but I guess like every, every 18 minutes, you know, what, what, what fraction of the United States today, you know, what, what's the temperature out there? What, where's the needle? How, what fraction of the United States believes in human-caused global warming? It's about 50 percent, and there's about 35 percent no warming, and there's people in the middle and so forth. And, and then somebody says, well, that must be because we have terrible science education. And again, they're just not really paying attention to evidence, evidence about what we know on the relationship between the answer people give to this question, essentially, do you believe in human-caused climate change, and their science comprehension. I mean, I, I've studied that. My collaborators and I did a large uh, national uh, survey, and we used the National Science Foundation science indicators battery, and you find, oh, well, we find there's no correlation. Uh, or, you know, that's actually not true. <laughs> that's kind of a lie. There's a big correlation between your level of science comprehension and your perception of climate change risks and whether humans are causing climate change. But, but what that relationship is depends on your political outlooks. If you're somebody who is to the left of center, more liberal Democrat, then you're more likely to believe in climate, human-caused climate change as your science comprehension goes up. But if you're somebody whose views are to the right of center, well, then you're less likely to believe in it. The political affiliations like religion are a, a kind of indicator of what kind of people we are. Right? It correlates in some way with, with different kinds of outlooks and styles. And that's what you're measuring when you ask people, do you believe in, in climate change? What kind of person are you? Now, I said it was possible right, if, if you designed the, the, the measure correctly to disentangle the issue of what people know about evolution from the, the information they're giving you about who they are when you ask them the standard survey question. Well, you can do the same thing. With, with climate change, right? So I constructed a, a climate science literacy battery, and, and I use some of the same strategies that people who've studied uh, education on evolution use, right? So essentially give some distance here. What does the evidence show? What is, what's the prevailing view among scientists? What do climate scientists say, right, about these issues? Hey, so what, what gas do most scientists say causes the temperature in the atmosphere to rise? Hydrogen, helium, carbon dioxide? Right? Oh, that's a pretty easy question. Even people at the mean on the score of, of the test, about 85% likely to get that right. Here's a hard one. Climate scientists believe that the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide associated with burning of fossil fuels would reduce photosynthesis by plants. Right? At the mean, people are pretty unlikely to get that one right. You know, and it doesn't matter whether you're a, what your political ideology is. It also doesn't matter what your political ideology is. If you know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, but you think it's going to kill all the things inside of greenhouses, you really don't know that much about climate science. Right? You don't really understand the basic mechanisms. This is pretty important. Now, as you become more science literate, using the general test I was describing before, you do become better at distinguishing the kinds of things that we would say climate scientists say about the causes and the consequences of climate change on the one hand that are true and the ones that aren't, which is good. I mean, we'd want the test to be measuring the, the comprehension of climate science that we'd expect people who are generally comprehending in science to have if it's a valid test. And here it doesn't correlate at all with people's political outlooks. Right? It doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or, or a Democrat. If you have the same level of science comprehension, you're just as likely to know about the basic mechanisms of climate change. Right? No polarization on that. Now, what's the relation? Remember, I showed you, showed you this and this. You know, what's the relationship between these positions on whether climate change is happening and it's human caused and scores on the, on the test? There isn't any. Right? I mean, there isn't any because what you believe about climate change isn't measuring what you know. It's measuring who you are in a way that we can, we can measure in different ways, including your political outlooks, right? And here, even though we, we can see, I and mean, I guess this is good news, because the most important thing to understand about climate change is that human beings, when they put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, are increasing the temperature. And that's an easy question, and, and, and everybody's got the memo, liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans. Still, if we ask people, you know, true or false, there's solid evidence of global warming due to human activities such as burning fossil fuels. 
you can see that we get the same kind of polarization. I mean, even the people, the Republicans, do really well on the rest of the test, they're saying no, because it's not measuring the same thing as these other questions. It's measuring who they are. Right? And I told you it's important. I mean, you, you make mistakes about what it is you're measuring with these kinds of, of items, and you can end up doing bad things. You might fail to teach people evolution correctly. And you, know, you, you might make mistakes, too, if you think this question is measuring something relating to people's knowledge about climate change. You might say, well, what we need to do is tell them you know, what the scientific evidence is and that scientists believe that, well, you know, they already know what scientists believe, right? That they tend to attribute to scientists beliefs in things that actually are more extreme than are true, that we're going to get skin cancer, or that the plants are going to die, and so forth. But that's not what explains the variance here. Right? This isn't what explains it. And in fact, this kind of communication, it, it seems to be reinforcing the association between the positions on climate change and who you are. Right? If you want to fix the problem, you, you have to do what was done in another context where there was this kind of entanglement between what people know and who they are, which is disentangle them. Right? I showed you how you can disentangle those two things in, in, with a measure. Right? But what we want to know is, can we do in the political realm what smart science educators and good teachers learn to do in the classroom for evolution? Right? Create a, an environment in which people don't have to choose between coming to know what's known by science and using what's known by science on the one hand and being who they are on the other because that kind of conflict is going to create polarization. And right now in our politics, <laughs> what we're measuring with the climate change question is the, 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 the issue, who are you? Right? That's the, the question that we keep posing pe to people in our politics. So how can we pose the question, you know, what do you know, <laughs> instead of who are you? And we have to do the, the disentanglement. I, I'm, I'm generalizing here from what we can learn from the experience with, with the study of evolution, right? a kind of disentanglement. Don't make reasoning-free people choose between knowing what's known and being who they are. Right? Remove that kind of conflict. And you know, I, I know it can be done <laughs> because I've, I've seen it done. I mean, I've, I've had the privilege, along with Katie, who does all the work, to, uh, <laughs> to observe and, and give some advice uh, to the members of the, the Southeast Florida Climate Compact. Um, and and they've, they've had tremendous, uh, tremendous success. I mean, this is what you would think if you didn't live in Florida about what's going on. Oh, that's stupid Rubio. Everybody's drowning there. And he says he won't say he believes in climate change. But, you know, Palm Beach County approves the climate change plan, right? I mean, maybe you know that, but, you know, about 1% of the population apparently does because it's not in the news. Why isn't it in the news? Well, Palm Beach County they needs some work on their communication because here's their, here's their minutes of the meeting, right? You know, it's down there that we adopted this climate plan, but it's like item 15. You know, we decided to repaint the county courthouse and we're going to fill in some of the potholes. Oh, yeah, we're also, we adopted a 110-point adaptation plan. You know, it's not that big a deal, I guess. <laughs> but that's the point. It isn't really that big a deal. Why? N not because people there aren't polarized. If you ask them, what do you believe about climate change? Who are you and whose side are you on? You'll get the same answer from them that you get from people in the rest of the United States. And you'll see the same kind of pathology that that polarization increases perversely as people become more science comprehending, do an even better job at figuring out what a person like me is supposed to say in response to a question like that. But if you ask them about what they know about what it's like to live in Florida and whether you should hide in the basement, for example, just because you got a silly tornado warning, they're laughing at me. Should we be using what we know? Should the government be taking steps to reduce the risk posed by rising sea levels? Should they be adjusting the, the land use regulations here to, uh, to take account of the climate impacts? Yes, 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 everybody says yes. And make sure they pick up the garbage every Wednesday too, right? <laughs> That's what you do, and we know that. And so the question is, how do you create an, a, a political deliberative climate that's going to engage people for what they know about the appropriateness of using the considerable intelligence that, that they have in Florida, because they've invested a lot in this, about how to deal with these climate impacts, and not the kind of issue, who are you, whose side are you on? 
I think that the, the, they, they'll tell you. That's what I think that they've managed to do. I, you don't see this kind of thing. I, I think this is not, what do you know? It's who, whose side are you on? I, I think it could have been plausible that you would try something like this, but this isn't really what the, the problem is. And maybe it does if you test it and come to the breakout session and we can talk about data on this. When people see this, they actually tend to associate the kind of stuff that the, the, climate, the climate compact is doing with the issues that divide them on climate change. And you don't want that. Well, what do you want? I mean, they know. Well, let's make sure that they know that it's us. You know, that they, they elected us to office. We, we think this is what we should be doing. Tell them that they're, they're neighbors, other people. And they're not all out there doing things, but it's important to know that your neighbor who you think knows what the heck's going on is out there doing something about it. Tell them that the, the businesses in the area support this, because they do, right? Tell them that's part of the people who, are, who know about the, the importance of using the best information we have for the way of life that they're leading. They're part of this process, right? So, you know, it's not us versus them. It's just us using what we know. I learned more than I could ever possibly have, have taught anybody in, in Southeast Florida about effective science communication. But, but there was a, a town meeting at the, the Climate Compact Summit a couple of years ago. I don't know, maybe the, the, the moderator was being punished. He, he, had had, uh, he was a Chicago radio personality who had been transferred to Southeast Florida, and he seemed to resent it. But he, oh, this will be an easy job, he says. You know, I'm up here with this panel discussing the, the climate. And I know how to do that. And he's going, well, what's wrong with those stupid Republicans? You know, they're, they're, they're anti-science, right? And, and, and industry, you know, they, they just care about profit today. They don't care what happens tomorrow. Right? And it's kind of an awkward silence. And then you get, you get Mayor Jacobs from Broward County. And she says, well, maybe you should look behind me. <laughs> and there's a banner, right, with all these corporate logos. These are the businesses in the area that are, that are sponsoring the compact. He says, if you're in business in Florida today, you won't be tomorrow, and you want to be if you're not trying to deal with this issue. It's crazy to think that people are in business here don't care about this. And, and by the way, you know, do you see that there are three Republican mayors and one Democrat mayor? This isn't about a partisan dispute. This is about using the information we have to deal with a problem. Right? This is about... <laughs> Not us versus them, but us, and using what we know. It's about if you're somebody who's trying to, to create an environment where people are going to make use of the information they have, removing the, the pressure that they feel to make a choice between knowing what's known, using what's known, and, and being who they are as members of, of diverse groups, because we are. Right? And so now I've told you everything I know. <laughs> If you do ask me what to do, I mean, I can tell you, look, I've given you a, a kind of a model here, the disentanglement principle, showing you how it's used in education and also in, in, in local government context very much like your own. I think, it, I think you should try to do something like this. And, but if you ask me how, I'm not going to tell you um, because I just don't know. Right? I mean, I know that these are important <laughs> principles, that these are the kinds of, of effects that you want to try to create in your, your communities. But you're going to know much better how to do that than I ever could. I didn't tell anybody in Southeast Florida how to do it. I couldn't possibly have done that. I told them things I did know that I think I hoped would be useful for them. But if they were useful, they were useful because they knew what the significance of, of what that would be for them. Right? So really, I've told you everything I know. <laughs> now you tell me you know, what the significance of this is. You tell me how it in your communities, you think you could disentangle the issue of what we know about using our best information to, to protect ourselves from the threats that climate change poses from this, this more divisive question, who are you and whose side are you on? Right? And then, you know, I'll help you. I'll try to measure, you know, to collect some data, tell you if that seemed, your, your conjecture about that has good foundation and whether when you tried something like that it worked, right? Because these are kinds of things where I think it helps to have evidence. Otherwise, you make all kinds of mistakes. You're not even sure what you're measuring, right? And I can help you a little bit with that. But really, you know, if, I can, if I'm doing my job, you should be able to tell me what it is that, that we should be doing. And then maybe I can help you to figure out how to do that as well as you can. All right, so that's the end. Was that more than 20 minutes? Can I keep talking? <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. That was um, both enlightening and entertaining, which those two don't often go in hand in hand. Um, I what think I we missed both. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I think I'm really hearing from you is that we need to change our framing. It's kind of Lakoff's message about framing rather than trying to change underlying beliefs that people have and then be able to give them room to uh, participate in the larger discussion on a co-equal standing. Is, is, is that what your data has, has demonstrated? Um, and, and, I mean, Steve will mention this, but at our breakout session, I can show you some of the data we have from Florida. It, it's not, I mean, I wouldn't disagree with you, um, although I think I might try to be more, more specific to try to, to distinguish one understanding of what framing might be from another. One thing is, well, you, you just want to, to kind of have the right, like, em emphasize national security, you know, and, and get, get, you know, a, 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 a conservative spokesperson or something like this. Frame it, frame it in some way that matters. And I don't think I'm, that, that's, that's possible, but I don't, I don't think that that's what I'm talking about here. And what I think this is about is, is, is creating in people's environment the same kinds of cues about what's known collectively that they normally rely on to figure out everything that they have to do that's informed by science. They're not getting, nobody's framing pasteurized milk for them. Right? <laughs> Nobody is framing that it's okay to buy a house near a, a high, high transmission power line. How do they figure that out? Not because they're experts in those topics, but because they're experts at extracting from an environment that they live in the kinds of cues about well, what it is that is known by science. People I know and trust who are competent, they're making decisions and acting in ways that evince confidence. And that's a good way to figure it out. And in a condition where we're polarized, that then we're going to be polarized because people are going to be doing exactly what they should, which is looking at what other people do, and they're going to get the wrong and the opposite answers. So what I'm saying is you want to remove that kind of, of contamination, that kind of pollution from your science communication environment. Once you've done that, I, I don't think it's going to be that everybody's going to be talking about climate change and that there's going to right? Most of them are just going to say, you know, I put you in position to do this. You know, you're doing your job. Good. I'm going to go about my business. Tell me about it in two years when you're up for re-election, right? But I think it's something like that. Although, you know, it's not inconsistent with what you're saying. How did you know I was a politician? <laughs> <laughs> now I'm really scared. <laughs> I said I had ESP. <laughs> uh, so, first of all, as a Yaley, I'm excited and proud. It was very exciting, and it definitely had the hallmarks of what I would call a, an epiphany in the sense that it is now obvious to everyone in this room what you're talking about, whereas before it was unknown. So that's this kind of thing where you say, aha, and of course now you see all these cues in the world where that has always been true, but we didn't notice it before, so thank you very much for that. Um, one question that I'm curious about is that there seems to be an acknowledgement of cognitive dissonance here, which we're not exploring. Um, and it's a relatively recently minted cognitive dissonance, uh, this concept that who you are is bound up in what you believe about climate is made, but how it got made is, is interesting to me. And I'm curious as to whether you or other people are doing research into the effectiveness of the last, I and mean, this is a 20 year communication, so yeah. there, there may be research on that. Yeah, and so, you know, I, I, maybe it's dissonance, uh, but, but, but in any case, the, 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 this, this conflict between knowing what's known right, and, and being who you are with respect to how you orient yourself with, to, to the science issues, right? That's the, the phenomenon. And there, there, this, climate change isn't the only instance of this, right? But, but really, the, the number of things that are like that is small compared to the number of things that aren't, right? Where people with these diverse views are, are, are lining up with each other. And so the question you asked, I think, is really the most important. I mean, we want to fix this problem, but you know, how does this kind of thing happen to begin with? I mean, yeah, you know, let's, let's try chemotherapy here on this, this pathology, but you can just tell people, stop smoking. You know, what is it that we're doing that causes the issues to become entangled in these meanings and then transformed into badges of identity in these groups? And at that point, I think it actually makes perfect sense. It, if you're going to judge me in my group based on my position on that, 
well then, you know, how I present myself to you can have a big effect on my life. What I think about the climate, I was really wishing that we didn't have that like tornado. I mean, they had no impact, right? The mistake, I don't matter enough as a voter, as a consumer, as an advocate even, <laughs> to, to influence that. So, you know, you put me in a position where I have to choose between getting it right with respect to who I am and knowing what the science is, I'll probably pick who I am because that's rational. But, but the pro it's, it's a disaster because if we all do this at once, we won't converge on the best information as a diverse society. But the problem isn't inside our heads. You know, it's, it's inside of our, it's, it's our polluted science communication environment. How did that happen? I think with climate change, it's really complicated, and I'm not really sure. But I, you know, if I look at something like the HPV vaccine, you know, try to look at little cases where you can see this happens a lot of times just by accident and misadventure. So we've got two more. Let's go here and then back there. <laughs> so, one of my aha uh -huh moments um, after layoff comes from being an urban planner. And, um, one, and I brought this up at the breakout session to our little group. It baffled me how, like what you said, how climate science has become so entangled in, in the politics. I was thinking in more simple terms that all communities do urban planning and they're so, and you know, elected officials are very comfortable with planning 30 years down the road and, and nobody has a clue whether all the population projection that they're doing will, and nobody questions whether those population projections are down to 100% accuracy and there's also contingency plans along the way, and everybody's comfortable with that. And I don't, uh, um, so I was looking at that as an opportunity, as a paradigm to use for a climate adaptation yeah. planning, and that adaptation planning should just be a component of this long-term comprehensive planning, instead of being pulled out of that discussion, yeah. and, that, and that it's not an issue. Well, I agree with you, although the question how to do it, you know, <laughs> is, 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 is still a, a difficult one, and one too where I think the number of plausible conjectures we'll have about how to restore that kind of engagement with the issue will probably be larger than the number of things that are actually true, which is why you collect evidence and, and, and so forth. But that's exactly you know, what I'm saying. And it's kind of remarkable. I mean, it, it reflects a kind of, like, a, a, a kind of bias in, in sampling, I guess, that, that people think that the problem we're having with climate change is that people don't know enough of the science when on all of these other issues that turn just as much on time, they don't know that either. But they're not stupid. What they know is whether the people they've entrusted to do this are actually going to be able to do the job. And, and that's, what, that's the thing that they're having a, a trouble with right now. The, the, to kind of go back just a second to this dissonance point, there is something, there are two things, going, there are two kinds of climate science people know about. There's the one that's entangled in this question, who are you, whose side are you on? They have a bunch of attitudes towards that that reflect the kind of position that they're put in because of a kind of status conflict between comp competing cultural groups in our society. And they're gonna be divided on that. But at the very same time, there's another kind of climate science. It, it, they're familiar with it. It's connected to what they do in their ordinary lives, what their communities do. A and it, it doesn't divide them. And I don't know if it's you know, dissonance or avoidance or what allows them to be able to, to use that information, right? But in Florida, they're really proud that they have five climate scientists from their university and, and their community on the national assessment planet. Somebody, a taxi driver might tell you that. Well, you're gonna, start, you're gonna know what it's like to live in Florida now. We, we've got our experts on the national assessment <laughs> plan because you guys, you don't know anything about water. We do. And I said, well, do you believe in climate change? Ah, with that climate change crap. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Same thing in Nebraska. You know, those guys don't believe it. Farmers, oh, it's Al Gore. But when the, the USDA climate modelers come to town, they're fighting to get tickets. They've been going to hear from these guys for 30 years, and in fact, they're gonna, they're, you know, they are really impressed with Monsanto for coming up with new genetically modified crops that will enable them to continue growing corn, notwithstanding the drought they know is that they're talking about a different thing in that context. How do we get the conversation on that? You know, what do we know about how to live rather than who are you and whose side are you on? And, you know, but, but 
that's the difference between the cases where we have a pathology like climate change and the, the, all the many more cases where it's just normal use of normal science to do what we need to do. May I offer another aspect that I find to be one of the challenges for the climate science? Um, in my personal experience, I have the greatest frustration with the climate scientists because they don't know how to communicate information to the people. Yeah. And I'm, for, I'm, I'm a federal, um, you know, government staff, right? And, and I get charts and from NOAA and the Corps of Engineers, and we're looking at it, and they're saying this is what it means, and we're like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and a lot of them, I have to reject them, and I, I can't even disseminate them to my working group because they're meaningless to us. And I keep telling them, you need to be better at using graphics. Yeah. And, and there's this, this attitude of, we're climate scientists. We talk like this to each other. And we use the same charts for how we communicate the data. It's important yeah. that we show it this way. But it's really, we're talking about a different audience now. But and that's my biggest frustration. You realize, oh, that's good, but you kind of make me feel inadequate here because I was going to tell you, tell you everything, I, everything I know, but you already know everything I'm going to try to say, plus 10 times more. I mean, here, here are two things that you've said that really it's kind of astonishing how obtuse we are about these things. In the cases where we're doing well, like where, where we're aligning ourselves with the best available science, and there are orders of magnitude more of those than ones where we're divided like this, it isn't because people have a better understanding of science. A, a, a biologist isn't a better kind of climate commu or science communicator than climate scientists. That's why nobody's divided about pasteurizing. No, people are orienting themselves with respect to these cues that don't have to do with a scientist communicating something to them. So it's actually kind of ridiculous to say, huh, we have a problem. Come on, climate scientists, you know, go learn how, to, don't talk like a scientist. This is like saying to LeBron James, you know, why don't you wear a headset and do play-by-play -play while you're on the court? You know, doing science and communicating in different things. And a society that thinks that has in its mind the picture of from the mouth of the scientist to the ear of the citizen is gonna screw up. At the same time, the scientist is presenting information to decision makers. And the decision makers need to understand what the relevance of the information is to the kinds of, of, of outcomes that they're trying to achieve. If they have the liberty of not being in one of these polluted science communication environments, and we're not using in that area either some of the really good evidence we have about how to make the kind of, of, of evidence that scientists have, especially with uncertainty, comprehensible to intelligent, practical decision makers. And you mentioned graphs. You know, graphs are the way, way to do it. There's lots of evidence on that. But those are two different kinds of science communication problems. So the other thing you know that I thought that maybe I could tell people about is that science communication isn't just one thing. You know, it's four or five, plus or minus two, right? <laughs> <laughs> the things you do to create a good science communication environment so your citizens are oriented towards the best information, that's one thing. How you present the information to a practical decision maker so that they can actually connect the information to the kinds of outcomes they are trying to achieve, another. But both of them admit of and in fact demand scientific investigation. If you just leave it, leave them to themselves, you end up with terrible misadventures. Here we have just time for one more for Dan Kahn. Uh, right back here. Uh, thank you very much. So one of my big aha moments um, in the last few years was when I found out that um, leading climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe is also an evangelist. And not only that, but she's a Canadian living in Texas. <laughs> what I was wondering about is if you could talk about those bridge builders or those people who sort of have um, a set of beliefs and uh, are following the science and, you know, have, are they are an entree into um, working with others or, or getting all on the same page or what do you think about so no, here, the, the first and most important thing is that um, you know there are there are many many plausible conjectures about what we should do and the idea that uh, you if you have somebody who's a scientist with whom people in the community identify that will make them more receptive and so we need to recruit more scientists I mean she, she's like this but so was the the fellow who was on the, the show, the, um, uh, Earth, the operators. 
Operator's manual. Yeah, what's the guy's name? I can't remember. a conservative scientist and so oh. No. Security manual? No. Yeah. Um, I think Newt Gingrich or he's something. He's from the military. No, it doesn't matter, yeah. but his place is that my memory holds up. But, the, but you, you want to test these things and see what happens. And, and that idea that if you just got the scientist who was a conservative to go up there, I mean, it's been tried. It doesn't seem to be having a big effect. It probably, but in all the cases where we don't have problems, it's not because there's a scientist from Texas I know who says that it's OK to live near the house where there's a high power transmission line. It's because I live in a community that is filled with transmission lines of what's known, and they connect scientists way down the line, you know, to me. And those are those are what seem to be broken. And so I don't. I mean, I think it's, it's fine to try those kinds of things, but I myself think on the on the basis of the evidence I've seen, that's not the kind of communication strategy that's going to work. People don't know who climate scientists are. You say James Hansen, and they go, you know, well, it's too bad he died because there's no new Muppets or something like that. <laughs> they don't look at the table. And if you make little cartoon figures, you know, like that look like Simpsons, with them, those people just aren't going to be seen by people, right? So, but I mean, but thank goodness people don't all agree with me because the only way to figure these things out is by testing different hypotheses and, and seeing what we can figure out in these ways. All right, Dan Kahan, thank you. I knew you guys were going to do that. I did. Oh, I did as well. All right, friends, we are going to move into another round of. Some other species of animal, true or false, has a zero correlation. Uh, with actual comprehension uh, of natural selection, random mutation, genetic variance, the, the core elements of the modern synthesis. Right? So the people who, who say that they believe in evolution, they're no more or less likely to be able to give you basically a, a high school exam quality explanation of how evolution works than the people who say that they don't. Um, and in fact, neither one of them is very likely to be able to do that. Right? And that, that might be a problem with our science education system. But obviously, the answer you give to the question, do you believe in evolution or not, that's not an indicator of what people know about evolution. Um, what it is an indicator of is, is their religiosity. Uh, essentially, people convey who they are when you ask them that question. And if they have a cultural style that features religiosity, then they're likely to say no. Um, and, and this is a conclusion, too. Uh, that rests on empirical research um, into what it is that you're measuring when you ask people the, the question, human beings evolve from another species of animals, true or false? That's a, a question on the, the National Science Foundation science indicators, science literacy test, and a, a whole bunch of other standardized tests that are used to kind of keep track of how the American public is doing over time and compare how we're doing to other countries. We're, we're just a little bit behind it. I don't want to like uh, kind of freak you out, and make you think I have ESP or something, but I, I kind of tried to anticipate, you know, what might you want to ask me, and, and this is what I thought it might be: <laughs> What can the science of science communication do for climate communicators? Did I get it right? I mean, it is kind of amazing, and <laughs> so, but don't don't freak out, and and. I don't know. Steve mentioned a short presentation. I guess that's coming up later because what I thought I would do <laughs> to answer your question is just basically like tell you everything I know uh, about climate communication, um, and, and then that would probably somewhere in that is the is the answer. Um, actually, I'm never gonna I'm never gonna answer your question, but I, I am gonna tell you everything I know. At which point, I think you're gonna be able to answer the question. Uh, don't worry because everything I know about climate science communication it fits in that little box. Right there. I mean, the print's really small, but still, I'll, I'll kind of go through it. Right? Th this is the this is what I know: <laughs> that that what ordinary members of the public believe about climate change 
done Afghanistan now on the on the indicators, right? But you have a bunch of a bunch of questions, right? And you see how Americans do. Well, you can compare how how people do on that question about evolution to how they do on the rest of the questions. But to give you an idea, right? There are a couple questions. Electrons are smaller than atoms. That, that's a pretty easy question, right? Because if if I if I look at how people do on the exam then even the person who's right at the mean score, right, the 50th percentile, there's still a 70% chance that that person's going to get that right, so it's not a very hard question. This one's a little harder. Which gas makes up most of the Earth's atmosphere? Hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. It's not underlined on the test. And, and <laughs> it's kind of hard because if you're, if you're around the middle, right, of the, of the group, you get the, the average score, only about 20% likelihood that you're going to get that one right, so it's harder. Right? Now here is the question, human beings as we know them today developed from an earlier species of animals, true or false? And it doesn't quite look right. <laughs> you see that the, the questions that are measuring what people know, they have this kind of profile. As you do better on the test overall, the likelihood that you're going to get the answer correct goes up. But here, the, the, the difference in likelihood of getting this answer correct, true, doesn't vary that much, whether you're at the mean, whether you're standard deviation below the mean, standard deviation above, 98 percent doesn't reflect what they know. It, it expresses who they are, right? So see, now you know, now you know what to do to communi communicate climate science. I mean, well, it's a little bit more to it. I mean, you, you, a few connecting principles. So you know, start out with something like less controversial and build up to, to climate change. But belief in evolution. Right here, that there's you probably see have seen this. Uh, well, you see this graph about once every 18 months. Um, that's that's how long the in the cycle is, I guess, for us to forget that about half the population uh, says that they don't believe in evolution when Gallup asks them this. And whenever uh, that survey gets released, um, there's always this kind of collective expression of, of shock um, and, and dismay. You know, what's wrong with our science education system? Even Miss America doesn't know um, about evolution. Um, and that response, in addition to, to, I guess, betraying a kind of short attention span since we have been being told this every 18 months for about 30 years, um, also reflects a, a kind of, uh, well, if not science illiteracy, at least science of science communication illiteracy, um, because there's a lot of research out there. Um, and what it shows is that uh, the relationship between the answer you give to this question, uh, do you believe in evolution or evolution, humans evolve from style, it's not really tightly correlated with how you're doing on the rest of the exam. And, and here's why. Right? The question might be understood to be measuring the science comprehension, right, which is what the test overall measures in people who are below average in religiosity, which you can measure by asking them how important is religion in your life, how often do you go to church, how often do you pray, other kinds of questions like that. They give you some information about how important religion is in people's lives. And if you're below average in that, well then the, the, the likelihood you'll get this answer right kind of bears the, the profile you associate with a question that probably is measuring that kind of comprehension in people whose ability in that uh, dimension varies. But that's not true for the people who are, are above average in religiosity. Right? It, no, no matter how well you do on the rest of the test, well, in fact, the better you do on the rest of the test, it, it's almost the less likely you are to get that one right. Um, now, this is not because people who are above average in religiosity don't know as much science. Um, in fact, there's a tiny little correlation between religiosity and how you score on the test. But what I'm showing here, these, these item response profiles are telling you what the likelihood that somebody is to get the answer correct given that they have a certain score on the test, right? So people who are above average and below average in religiosity, 